Well, welcome everyone to another Metals Investment Forum. So let me reach out and thank Matt Bennett and all involved. I'm, uh, it's a bit of an honor to be invited back so many times. So today I'm the keynote. And as most know, I'll probably focus mostly on silver, but I want to focus on the big, big picture. And the big, big picture is quite a picture indeed. So first thing I want to do is go ahead and um, I'm going to go ahead and give you like the inside track this time, as if you are a paid member of the silver investor, or I should say the Morgan Report silver investor is just kind of a placeholder these days. So here we are, and this is the current report. I'm not going to read the whole thing. For those that are members, you'll know what you, you know, you're going to see because you pay me and you get it every month. For those that aren't, uh, I just want to make a few highlights on my, uh, and this is only about three days old. So this is about as fresh as it gets from my thinking. And as you can see here, I have to admit, that this is probably the most difficult editorial I've ever written. And I mean that sincerely, because one, I want to be of maximum benefit to everybody here at the Metals and Investment Forum and anybody that's an investor that's either casual or not, or people in general. Having said that, I will give you my best take on the current Ukraine situation. That's my take from the best sources available. I've been born in the North America, and so I'm biased. I was taught from the time I was a little kid in grade school that Russia bad, Russia bad, Russia bad. And that theme hasn't gone away. <clears throat> However, I try to get both sides of the story and present the best that I can. So one of the things that very few people are interested in, this is a bit esoteric and kind of woo-woo, it's out there, but I said, let's start and begin with something that's rather far-fetched. According to a thread that I give credence to, it was reported that a Vatican insider, you can check this out, named Malachi Martin, said that Russia and Ukraine played a major role in the end times events. In 1996, it was said that the on a national radio show, that was the Art Bell show, that Russia would be the salvation of the world. From that information, we obtain the quoted material, which states, and here it is on page two, uh, salvation for the world, the cure for the world's ills will start in the Ukraine and Russia. And that was why the Virgin in the Fatima vision of 1917 was supposed to have spoken actively about Russia and on it goes. So that's a background. Is that true or false? I don't know. I'm just putting out information that I have garnered to try to put this whole puzzle together. And again, I don't want to read the whole thing, but my main premise, which I didn't um, emphasize and I should, I start every letter with a quote. And the quote here is very important. And it's all wars are bankers wars. There is a documentary by Michael Rivera on the links there, but you can look it up, all wars are bankers wars. So that is the perspective I've taken on the whole. The other part, as I said in this, I won't read it to you, I wrote recently, my memory is good, is that if you really wanna be objective, uh, and I won't call myself a journalist, I'd rather call myself an analyst, but call me, hey you, I don't really care. The idea is if you follow the money, you are probably going to be more accurate than if you start getting emotional or taking sides. Or It's hard to, to objectively look at anything in the human realm because we all have our biases, our prejudices, whether we admit it or not. So, and the last, first thing to go in war is the truth. So if all wars are bankers' wars, follow the money, and the first thing to, to go in a war is truth, we have a pretty good basis for how I thought and wrote about the situation. So we go on and say, you know, a lot of this is, you probably heard, so I won't read too much. Now, Putin had already gone to this, I think it's called the Minsk Agreement, that they were, you know, already got these two territories, but it was the Western powers that reneged on the contract. It was the Western powers that said they wouldn't go any further east and they wouldn't put Ukraine into NATO. So we, the Western, powers are the ones that basically broke the contract, not Putin. I'm not taking sides. I'm being objective here. So went on and on. And basically, I forget exactly how I ended. The, politic, uh, the politicians directing the war script are the same criminally corrupt, genocidal control freaks 
that ruined your life in the past two years. And before we forget to mention it, our thinking is that round two of the pandemic may be coming. There is some evidence of that. Russia took out bioweapons labs in Ukraine. All official news sources say this is disinformation. But you pay for a newsletter writer like me to dig out the best of their human ability with other people what's really going on. I was introduced to the newsletter industry years ago. You might have heard one of my podcasts about that. Our point is that if you thought round one of the pandemic was bad, wait till you see the criminals, like leaders question mark, are capable of in a lights out scenario, which we're all talking about a possible cyber attack for sure. So I don't wanna waste any more time um, there. I just wanted to give you a background that I'm very concerned about the banking system as I have been for years, more so now it's accelerating. I don't want to panic anyone. I don't want to make people afraid. I want to help. And so as I've taught for years, if you have a certain percentage in real metal, then you have got something outside of the banking system. And as much as cryptos purport to be outside of the banking system, and in many cases they are, they still rely on a robust infrastructure electronically. And metal in your hand does it. And that makes it superior for all possibilities. Uh, I'm not against crypto, I'm pretty neutral and favorable. So that's another set of ideas. So since I've got you, uh, and I know a lot of the people in the uh, in Metals Investment Forum, this I'm just scrolling through the letter, you see what you get, what you pay for here. I mean, you get, you know, I'd rather have it, um, I don't like to long letters, but mine are always long because we want to give value and it just works out that way. So I've been a proponent of uh, cash rich unhedged mining companies, which really royalties for a long time. So this is the exact portfolio that we have currently. Um, you can see uh, Hecla, Endeavor, Franco Nevada, my, one of my favorites, First Majestic, Wheat and Precious Metals, Pan American, and Admico Evil. Any and all those are good for the top tier. What I teach my people is pick about three. And Hecla is not my favorite, although I think it just hit a new high today as I'm doing this. Franco is one. You're going to pick three. If I were to pick three right now, Franco just made a new high. I don't know about Wheaton. And if you're predisposed to silver, I'd take Pan American, Wheaton, and Franco. That's an example. Um, on the mid tiers, I really like Mag. I really like Osisco. I like them all, but those two would probably round out like five. And those speculations, uh, these are money you can afford to lose. I know that many on the MIF are wonderful people, wonderful company, working hard, but those are long shots for the most part. There's nothing wrong with that. We would not have a mining industry without them. It's critical. However, it's extremely difficult to pick the winners from the losers and you're best off to let companies develop and pay a higher price as they develop and you have more information. And I learned that the hard way. So with my almost 50 years now in this business, um, I can say that with some authority. Does that suit you? Not necessarily. However, I do to our people say, you know, bet what you can afford to lose until the company has changed enough for it to really manifest what they have said in their mission statement. So we do have had the cryptos in here. They're all up three, 400%. Omanika, a really good story. Uh, in fact, I met them, I think at one of the MIFs, maybe mistaken, Matt, I think it was. Uh, Silvercrest, EnviroLeach, it's now EnviroMetal. I should have changed that. That's an error. Uh, to change its name, I'll have to correct that. Menorum has got a huge deposit. And energy fuels my favorite on the uranium sector because it's uh, US based and they have rare earth elements as a kicker. And we held that probably longer than I should have, but I really believed in the company, the fundamentals of the management. And we were down quite a bit, but again, money could afford to lose. And now it's up almost 200%. So there, I've given you the portfolio. You got to see it all. You could take notes, take action or not. Uh, I just want to do as much as I can this time as a keynote for the metals investment forum. So now let's go ahead and move into what we have here, which is uh, 
this is my dashboard. I have several of these services. I use um, this one, stock charts, the most frequently uh, for a variety of reasons. So I always look from the top down, meaning the long, long picture, and then, uh, you know, drill down from there. So if you get that 30,000 foot view, uh, take a deep breath to kind of get the big picture, then, you know, and you find the airport, then you can fly down and, and, and land accurately. If you're close to the ground and you're looking for the airport, you might not see it. So that's a bit of a metaphor. So we look at copper, you can barely see it, but where my cursor is, I mean, it's just going parabolic, just like a lot of things. So copper has gone roughly from 450 to over five here in this, this few trading sessions, really. Gold, you can see the same thing. I'm going to change the scale on these charts. I just want to scroll down a little bit. Uh, the HUI. So there are times when the stocks outperform gold, and there are times when gold does better than the stocks, or at least equal to it. Right now, I've always advocated having both for different reasons, but the stocks are going to take are taking off. You can see basis the HUI. We're already challenging this top that was way back in uh, June, May, June, and we're right there right now. And we will continue. Now, we won't continue without a correction at some point. And my guess would be we'll visit this area again. So as an example, basis the HUI, and this is my best guess, but I've been at this a long time. If you see 327 and it goes to 350, it'll probably retrace down to about 327 or thereabouts and then take off again. That's normally how they go. This whole part of the move may or may not hold. I have a feeling that it will because of what I outlined when I read part of the report that tensions are getting increased and increased. There's food supply problems and this war thing is, is unfortunate, but a reality. And the SWIFT system really doesn't go offline until the 11th of March. So that is going to be a day of reckoning, in my opinion, where you might go to the bank and not be able to withdraw money. I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just saying what could, not would happen. So you've got some time to get to your coin dealer. You've got some time to shift. Maybe you've got too much in the speculative side, maybe move into the top tier. It's trying to help here. So uh, platinum plate, I'm going to skip. Silver, I will come back to, but it's starting to run, as you all know. And uh, it's gone from this washout bottom here around 2150 that I said I thought would hold. Said that to my paid members. Of course, I, how low could it go? I said it could go to 18, but I thought 2150 would hold. It's tested it you know, one, two, three, four times and held. So that's a pretty good indicator. Now, of course, we're up pushing into the, you know, 26th level plus, which is still very, very cheap for silver. And let me come back to um, what else do we have? Stock market, I think, <clears throat> is worth taking a look at. Let me just change the scale on this real quick. And let's just look at the last three years and let's look at the weekly so we get that top level view. And um, let me hit update. <clears throat> so stock market's got a long ways to go for a, a major correction. But what we see is big volume on down days. That means it's going lower. We're seeing it broke the 50 day moving average, tested it, and then hit it and failed, and now it's coming down. So the big line of demarcation is the 200-day moving average. It bases the spoons of the SPX. That is, as you can see on the chart, 3,400. That's a long ways from 4,400, where the 50-day moving average is. It's my contention that we could get down into that level. I don't see a stock market crash uh, as being imminent. I do think we'll see weakness in the stock market. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So let's go back and look whoops, at some of these other charts. And um, I think I like to start with gold. If we go to gold and we take a more, we take a weekly view. <clears throat> let's do a monthly view. And let's do, uh, let's do three years. 
So on a monthly basis, you can see gold is looking good, but not as good perhaps as you know we might feel. Not that it's not going to go higher. It's just um, that we have got a trading range. I'm using the monthly charts here, and I'm showing you the trading range here for three years. And we see that if you go back here, that on a monthly basis, gold has gotten, according to this, over 2,050. And now we are in the 2000 range. So it's been in a wide trading range from roughly 1700 to we'll call it 2000 for quite some time, year and a half or so, I'm eyeballing this. And once we get above that level, that 2025, I'll call it, we are in new highs. Yes, there's this peak over here, but for all practical purposes, once we hit 2000, 2000 is a meaningful number chart wise, which I just showed you. and psychologically. Once gold hits 2,000 and stays there for a while, there'll be a new psychology. Gold's at 2,000. Everyone that's a gold bug and a lot of people that follow gold will know 2,000. And once it holds again that number, then look out, we're going to go higher. I think on this run right now that we're looking at probably $2,500 gold or thereabouts. Whenever you make a round number, you're usually wrong. So let's say 2480. I mean, something like that's pretty close to 2500. Talked about the HUI. One mention of platinum palladium. Um, let me, uh, I'm just going to say verbal. Palladium is really and has been trading like a free market metal for a long time. Why? Because it's super scarce. It's, uh, depends who you read, 15 to 30 times more scarce than gold. And it comes mostly out of Russia. So there's a lot of, well, the Russians are holding back. Maybe they are. Regardless, it's needed for catalytic converters mostly. It's almost all industrial use, but it's an absolute must have. And Russia has a lion's share of it. So it's really a cash and carry market. You got to put up right now about $3,000 US to buy an ounce of plate that market will continue in that direction in my view. Platinum could be substituted, but none of the auto manufacturers have really done it. And whether or not they will elect to do it, I don't know. There was a big platinum report put out and I talked about it and I spent too much time on platinum palladium because most of you are gold people and silver people, but um, I have some platinum. I sold my palladium or actually traded it, swapped it at $2,700 for $18 gold, excuse $18 silver. And I'm happy I did that. Um, so let's go ahead and look at the silver chart and let's take a longer view weekly. And I'll go for three years like we did with gold to try to be consistently accurate on this. So there we have it. And of course, if we do a quick annotation um, and look at the same parameters as gold, we will see this kind of a trading range, okay? So there's my 2150 I talked about. And I said four times, like one, two, three, four, that not quite. And uh, 29 seems to be the cap. And so right now with all that's going on, Silver's you know, doing well, I'm happy, I'm pleased. It was up like 93 cents on the open this morning, but we're not even at 29, which is the upper part of this channel formation. So gold is leading the way right now, which is not surprising because gold gives you guaranteed purchasing power in all, in all economic climates. Yes, it gets undervalued. Yes, it gets overvalued. Right now it's undervalued, but it's basically doing its job. Silver is going to have to play catch up here, and it will. And how much, I don't know. I think what will happen is we will probably not get to 30 on this run. I don't know. I'm just giving you my thoughts. Um, and then we'll probably back off. I do know it's going over 30 this year, probably. Um, some of the analysts, bank analysts, think that uh, this run is going to be overdone. I think it will be because of all this going on with war and panic and banking and all the unknowns. And so paper price wise, 
Uh, I will be putting out an alert to my people when I sense it, smell it, decode it. I'm not perfect, but I do pretty well. And sell in the strength. And what we normally do, the Morgan Report, is we write covered calls on our top tiers. So like um, Franco, Wheaton, Pan American, Agnico, those kind of companies have options available. They're very juicily priced at highs. And you can rent your stock for three months and make like 10, 12, 15% sometimes. And if you're right about it being a temporary high and it only taking you know, a few months to back off, uh, you could keep your stock and a, a pretty tidy profit. If you just roll over month after month and write covered calls on gold stocks, I had an analyst do it for me. I had him on my mastermind. Was a 40% return per year. Now, I won't say that's true every year, but the year he analyzed, that was a return. So you're going to actually make a business out of covered call writing if you want to. So I digress, but this is an investment conference, and it is my privilege to be able to have the keynote, and I'm trying to give as much useful information to everybody as I possibly can. So so we talked about copper, we talked about gold, we talked about silver and HUI, um, we talked about platinum and palladium, we talked about the stock market. So here we should talk a little bit about the dollar um, because there are so many, so much depends on the dollar. I mean, we all know that it's the reserve currency of the world and that Everybody depends on the dollar. And now that Russia is being cut off from the Swiss system, we will see that uh, there's going to be probably more of a push into the dollar market on a short-term basis. But on a long-term basis, um, no, the dollar will come down. And I'm pretty strong about that idea, as are many. So dollars actually kind of like silver. If you look at this three-year chart to be consistent with what I did with gold and what I did with silver, you can see that the dollar peaked up on the dollar index to 104 a couple of times back one and a half years ago or something, similar to what gold did. Uh, interesting, you know, gold and, and um, the dollar move opposite. Not always. Gold moves more inversely to the stock market than it does the dollar market. Regardless, it's acting like silver. It hasn't broken to a new high. Will it? I think it will, but not much more. I'd be surprised if it got back up to these highs, although it could. But I'll, so much remains indeterminable at this point because of the SWIFT system being cut off, Russia, what are they going to do next, food issues, gasoline, petrol, bank closures. I mean, so much is happening. Um, but I wouldn't be a real big dollar bull here, uh, but I'm not a bear. I do think it's going to, again, uh, make uh, this leap above the 100 level and probably stay there for a while, consolidate. But longer term, <clears throat> I'm pretty bearish on the dollar. So it looks like I'm coming into a last three minutes or so. <clears throat> and I just want to wish everyone absolutely the very best. And times, in times like these, it really pays to remain grounded and centered as much as you possibly can. Realize there's more to the human experience than money. Yes, money is security, money is savings, money, money is a buffer, and money is important. But what's more important is how you interact every day. And so if you've got plenty, you know, you might look at people that don't. If you um, have the ability to just, you know, spend that extra moment of being kind, being considerate, giving a genuine heartfelt compliment to somebody, I suggest you do so. And no one there gets there alone. In other words, the lone wolf with a pile of gold at the top of the mountain with a bunch of freeze-dried food and two helicopters is not the plan. The plan is to build communities from the ground up and be heartfelt in your communications. And we will, humanity, always persevere. Yes, there are casualties, and yes, there will be casualties, but you don't have to be one.